Hello and welcome to another Sonic Lab. Today we're having a quick look at the brand new Focusrite Scarlet. This is the Mark III or third generation, uh, just out from Focusrite. Um, we've actually had a couple of these before. We've been using the uh, 2i2, which is, uh, a lot of people use these little things. I, I, they tell me it's the best selling audio interface of all time. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I, we certainly use it a lot for just sort of general utilitarian things. And I know a lot of other people do as well. So. The Scarlet is here. This is the, we've got the 18i20, uh, which is the sort of the flagship top of the range. Normally, I wouldn't bother reviewing you know the big boys because um, I don't normally use that many inputs. But the reason I'm using this is because uh, we've got an ADAT output hooked up, and we're putting it um, in the uh, Expert sleepers, which we're running via Ableton Live and uh, a beta of the CV tools. Yeah, I'm living dangerously to run the Neutron and various other things. So I wanted to kind of try and see what it was like in a typical setup. So first of all, let's take a look at the unit. This guy comes in the box. It's got rack ears that you can stick on, so it will rack mount. We've got two combi inputs on the front, which can be switched to implements, in, instrument inputs. Then there's another six on the back. Uh, there's also 10 analog outputs because you've got um, lots of alternative monitors and what's not. And then there's two sets of ADA outs. The reason there are two sets is because if you're running in 96K, you need to use two pipes. But essentially you only get eight IO in the, uh, from the ADAT. Um, so it doesn't quite, yeah, it doesn't quite work in the same way. So you don't get 16 ADATs, you get eight ADATs, but up to 96K. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So, on the front panel, uh, we've got a lot of uh, additional buttons. We've got 48 volt, volt switching from one to four, five to eight. Shame we have to do that uh, in such large blocks because it always makes me a bit scared. I mean, most mics will actually deal with 48, modern mics that is, but it's always uh, nice to know that you're not likely to blow anything up. Um, then moving along, we've got the input gains for the eight analog channels uh, with these two here. Um, these have got, the first two have got instrument settings, which is sort of low Z setting for guitars and whatnot. We've got pads on the front panel. Uh, and we've also got metering for the eight. And the reason you can see that one here is because I've got this uh, uh, Rode Procaster mic, which is a dynamic mic, which I'm running into channel one, which you can see there. Uh, metering, there's a, a lock signal, which means that it's got sync lock. Uh, you've got MIDI IO. Uh, and we've also got USB-C. This is actually USB-C only. All right, coming back to the front panel, uh, we've got monitor control. Uh, we can set up alt monitors uh, and we can set up talk back. There's a little mic in here. We've got a dim and a mute. And a dim doesn't seem to have a preset value, which is a shame because I always like to set it, you know, whatever I want. Then we've got two separate extra headphone mixes out, which are separate outputs. Round the back, uh, we've got the MIDI I.O. as we said, we've got the USB-C, and we've got um, SPDIF I.O. and a word clock. Now the SPDIF is really handy to have because some people have uh, other interfaces they like to clock from that you can use SPDIF as a, as a clock input source. So one of the things that, uh, another of the things that the, uh, the Scarlet Mark III's have, or third generation have, is all the way down the line, that's right down to the 2i2, they have this air feature. Now air is something from the Focusrite ISA interfaces. It's a sort of transformer sound, and it's a circuitry you can switch in across all channels. And what it is, I'll try and put up a handy graphic here, is it's like a 4 dB boost from about 100 hertz up to about 10K. So you get this, it's not totally linear, it's got a little bit of a curve to it, but it adds this extra sort of, Low, well, there's a sort of a tilt, it's like a tilt EQ, and it sounds posher. Um, and you, you enable that, you can't do that via the front panel. Uh, there's a little air legend underneath all of these, but you have to do that in software. So this is the Focusrite control software. I think this is version, uh, let's see, three point something or other, 3.1, it's quite hot off this press. Uh, so as you can see here on the input settings, we can change the instrument and uh, line levels on the first two, and also engage the pad. Obviously these buttons are mirrored on the front of the first two channels, and then pads are on the other eight. Uh, the only button you can't engage from the front panel is air, uh, but you do get a little indicator, as you can see there. We'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, more on the controls. Um, we can set the sample rate here. Obviously, we can go from 44.1 right up to 192. If you're in 192 uh, uh, or for, above 48, you're going to need the dual ADAT if you're going to be using clock source. We've got internal SPDIF and ADAT. 
then we've got digital I.O. mode, which um, these are three different uh, digital I.O. modes that allow you to uh, use the SPDIF on one of the optical connectors or use dual ADAT for the higher sample rates. Uh, there's also speaker switching. Uh, well, first of all, as you can see here, we've got, if I go to my output routing, you'll be able to see the controller, the knob is adjusting outputs one and two, uh, so that gives you my main monitors, but I can switch an innate, uh, um, speaker switching, uh, which means that when I hit Alt, uh, I, the monitors are coming out of outputs three and four, so it's fixed one and two, three and four, but I've got the ability to have two sets of monitors. I've also got a dim, uh, which unfortunately doesn't seem to have any kind of uh, preset level. It's whatever they decided, and it's a bit too quiet for me. And then obviously mute, just kind of handy having that monitor control right there. So if I just come back to the input settings, uh, I'll, I'll disable that. Um, obviously we can control the monitor, we can say the monitors to come out of any of these output sets of outputs, one and two, three and four, or all of them, which is quite handy for perhaps surround sound. Um, output routing, very simple. Um, we can basically just say what we want to come out. Monitor outputs one and two, uh, line outputs three and four. I can make that mono if I want, uh, which I am using because I'm using it as a send. I'm just using it for software playback, but I can add additional mixes. So for instance, I can just go into here and I can create a custom mix. I can just add channels in singles or pairs uh, and just hit all of these. I've got a little bit of a feedback loop going there, so I don't really want that. Uh, and I can just hit mute there. So this enables me to create these custom mixes that will be coming out of these outputs. And we've got all the outputs, analog outputs and ADA outputs down here we can have in mono and stereo. And then it's possible just to save uh, your snapshot if you want it on your system. So I think the only problem with that is, again, it sort of feels like if we've got all these mixer capabilities, I want program changes. I want to be able to grab this and this is affecting the level or the mute or the some sort of headphone mix. It just feels like we could have all of this stuff. Wouldn't it be great? And then we wouldn't have to have the computer. It could just be, uh, you know, something that we were routing in. In fact, in this, this, this setup here, I've got, I tried to show a kind of, a way I might want to use it. So at the moment, I've got a microphone going into channel one, which is this uh, Rode Procaster right here. I'll show you the air setting on that a little bit later. Uh, then I've got uh, the Behringer Neutron coming out of here and into uh, input two. I've got the Minilog XD going into inputs uh, three and four. And then I've got the Ventris, which is on a sort of send, coming uh, out of output three and back into inputs five and six. So I've kind of got a, a, an effect send setup, but this is all working kind of within my uh, DAW session. Uh, one last thing, I've also got uh, an expert sleepers ADAT ES3, which will take the ADAT input and outputs clock and CV, which is um, CV and gate and whatever else I want. And that is what's driving uh, the neutron in this situation. So it's probably a, a reasonably typical setup and that's all being brought in. And then I've got my uh, monitor control and muting and dim and whatnot here. So if I now go to my live session, I'm running 10.1, I'm running the uh, CV tools uh, so that means essentially I'm taking the uh, CV, DC couple TV and running gate and uh, pitch into the neutron, not using MIDI in this case, and I can just play. There we go, and you can see that I'm playing it through. I've got latency set pretty low on this. I'm running this at 40, 48. And I'm at 64 samples, which is actually pretty damn quick, you know, so I'm not experiencing any issues with that. I did, uh, when I was in 44.1, experience a few more issues, so this is a little bit better. And there's a bit of drive and distortion in this, that's just the sound of the actual uh, synth itself. So what I've got this set up is also, you see I've got my sends here, so I've got uh, uh, this guy mapped which is the, what is it, launch control, or keeping it in the family. I've got this map to ascend, so that means I can now, I turn my effects returns up. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna freeze that. Just cause I can, you know, me and my freeze. Take my effects end down, now I've got this little, uh,
we've got an LFO coming out of here, which I can just patch in. This is again coming out of the expert sleepers. You can see it here on the screen. Jolly good. Now, if I come back to my uh, my other synth, I come out and record on uh, the main channel. I'm just going to switch on my XD channel. The way I've got this set up is. Send on That's nice. And this is basically, I've just got on this channel, I'm using an external instrument, so I'm sending the MIDI. via the MIDI channel on the on the back of the USB uh, on the back of the, the unit, so the MIDI channel, and I'm returning it via inputs straight into the channel. And I think it works really well. So what I'm trying to demonstrate is really live inputs into this, plus playback into this, plus an effects loop into this, and this is all working at quite good latencies. If I just stop this and turn this down, um, one thing I will say, and I have mentioned this perhaps before, is um, the USB cable is quite critical. It does come in the box with this USB-C to USB-A adapter, it means it's compatible with any USB equipped computer as long as it's USB 2 and above. But I, I just thought, I know, I'll use a USB-C cable. I've got one of those and I grabbed it and I plugged it in and it really wasn't having it at all. It was, there were all sorts of clocking issues. So I ended up using the, um, the one that comes with the Mac, which is, uh, you know, I guess a better quality one than the one I checked in. The other thing is uh, in OS X Sierra, which is 10.12, there are some glitchy issues at, at 44.1 and they've, they've been aware of this and uh, they've tried to minimize it. But I think basically at 44.1, you just get this little tick once in a while. And I don't know whether that's doable. I didn't want to update my system because I'm, I'm in Sierra, of course. Uh, and I didn't really want to update it to, you know, because I've got so many other things on this computer, but works fine at 48 and other frequencies as well. So I guess the other thing to check out is the mic. And I've got the mic here. Um, I will, what I'll do is if I, I'll just, you can see that's coming in there. And I turn my channel on just because I've got it on a mute. One, two, 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 two. So this is the mic directly in, as you can hear. I've got the gain set quite high on this, but I always used to have to do that anyway. I've got no processing on this. If I now go to uh, my input and I can set it up so you can hear, this is without air and this is with air. Without air, with air. I guess if I said something rather breathy and that, you might be able to hear it a bit better. So it on a dynamic mic, it kind of lifts it. It's, it's quite subtle. I mean, it's only 4 dB at uh, of tilt between 100 and 10K. So it's not like a massive curve, but you can sort of add that up. It adds a little bit of extra brightness and extra uh, kind of just, just sort of presence, I suppose. That's the thing. So now with this uh, change of scene, I've got the ribbon mic up and the ribbon mic is a much smoother, kind of more even type of sound. So uh, I've got a latency here of uh, 64 samples and I'm monitoring through uh, the uh, DAW. So if I close that window there, you can see I'm just monitoring through um, through the input channel. So uh, let's just see what the air sounds like. I, I should also point out, if we look at the gain, I've got a lot of gain on this, but it's enough for the ribbon mic. Um, the only thing I would say would have been nice if you hear, I'm just I'm trying very hard not to get that low rubber. It would be nice to see some sort of high pass filter on the input channel, just maybe a 75 hertz or something, just just so that you didn't have to use that in software. But hey, it's not the end of the world. And of course, if I want, I can uh, add some compression or something. I'd put that in, and that's that's quite vicious. But again, that's real time, and I'm monitoring myself in real time, and I'm not getting any latency. That's at uh, 64 samples, so it's pretty damn good. So if we now go to um, the input settings on here and you'll be able to hear quite easily if i press air 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 on the ribbon mic is much more pronounced because it's a much more smoother and even curve to begin with so as you can hear there's off there's 
that and then on there's that it feels like there's just more presence and it does sound really rather nice on the ribbon so let's now try the tambourine test which is something that Gaz Williams recommends it's very good for testing the transient response of an A to D uh, particularly on an audio interface so uh, I'll get my levels right I think I've set them about right don't want to get too close to the ribbon because maybe I can take that up a tiny bit if I get close enough I get distortion because the air is being pushed so I'm still a bit hot so now if I go to my input channel let's just record a bit of that let's see what that sounds like Okay, that sounds pretty good. I mean, essentially, uh, what we're testing for there is how the A to Ds can handle that input transient because uh, sort of lower quality ones will really struggle with the tambourine. It's for some reason, it's just got all that high frequency contents and it can sound really sort of scrunchy and unpleasant. That actually sounded pretty good. I mean, and it should do because the Scarlet uh, IO is increased in specifications from the previous generation. I, I forget the actual numbers, I'll, I'll put them below, but we get an improvement again in the input uh, distortion, the, the noise level and that sort of stuff. So the, the Scarlet Generation 3 range is available right across. There's, a, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight models. Uh, we were looking at the 18i20 here, uh, and that comes in at 449 UK pounds. Other currencies will scroll below, but you can go right down to the solo and the sort of further down the range and pay as little as 99 pounds. I'll put all the, the, the pricing of the various units in the show notes somewhere. I, I, I like the sound of it. It feels like an improvement. I've only used, like I say, the 2i2 before, which is dead simple. There's no real kind of monitoring or any issues with that. I guess with the, uh, the, the 18i20, uh, we start to get into having to use a much more complex routing. And it's great to have all of those capabilities. But like I say, I would like to see MIDI control of that stuff. That would be awesome. Uh, I would also maybe like to see a high pass filter on the uh, at least two of the channels. That would be nice. But overall, it's a fairly solid system as long as you're running above 10.12. Below 10.12, you can get a little bit of clocking issue. And as long as you remember to use a decent USB-C cable, because they're not all the same. Anyway, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, see you next time.